Hello, wildlings. I'm your Creepsmith, and you found my Fear Forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Everyone knows about the point of no return. Trouble is that everyone doesn't always include the person reaching or even passing that point. Luckily for our hero this evening, they have a lovely, helpful guide to remind them that explorations do have boundaries and consequences. Continuing the series, tonight's reading, Butcher Face, Part 6, by Dash 32. Sorry for the long absence, again. I've mostly come back due to a huge number of Redditors sending me messages, and a number of others who claim to have come into contact with Butcherface or his media, as well as wanting to know more about what's been happening. A few of them have even, somehow, gotten a hold of my email, and they've been sending me questions and notes about Butcherface and his followers. The thing is, I've been trying to stay away from him and his media. I'm going to continue my story mostly because you guys have asked for it. Strange stuff is still happening, and I'm hoping that recounting these events may be therapeutic. But in saying that, I haven't and won't be deciphering Butcherface's messages and media for the most part. You guys are welcome to do it, though. Um, I will also not be giving proof, as in pictures or articles surrounding these events. Sorry, just not going to do it. And again, sorry about the length. This may be the longest chapter yet. Now, after the events at the end of the previous chapter, almost five months ago, my life has changed a lot, and I've been dragged deeper down the rabbit hole. The morning after Chris claimed that I was falling under Butcherface's spell, we went outside and found they all wound, and the last one kills, gouged into the wall of our house in the backyard. I then made my way into the woods to retrieve my car. The back window and the windshield were spared, but all of the other windows had been smashed. Ten is time to tell a tale was also scratched into the passenger side door. Shortly after this, Chris essentially stopped talking to me. I occasionally chatted with his ex, but it always seemed strained. The worst part was that Emma would refuse to come over after being chased by Butcherface or one of his followers in the previous chapter. Thankfully, she was still willing to see me and I'd hang out at her house. I hadn't been sleeping very well, though. It didn't seem to be my normal case of insomnia. Usually I'd just lay in bed and not be able to fall asleep at all. But now, I felt like there was some thought growing at the back of my mind. It was like I was forgetting something. This would make me feel restless and I'd pace back and forth around the house. I'd sometimes take a sleeping pill, but I didn't like to use them too often after the last time I'd used one. After a few days of doing this, I started feeling cooped up in the house and started taking walks outside at night. The problem is that these nightly strolls would ultimately lead me to staying up later and later. This obviously led me to waking up later and being late to work on more than one occasion. Chris was also spending less time at the house. I had no clue where he was going at the time. One night shortly after this, I'd been taking one of my nightly walks when I all of a sudden realized that I had walked farther than I ever had up to that point and found myself at the town park. It's small, with the generic assortment of playground, recreational equipment. You know, swing set, seesaw, sandbox, merry-go-round, all of that stuff. I sat on one of the swings and started tossing small rocks at a nearby tree. I eventually got into it and really started throwing them at it. Then I actually found myself hacking into it with a sharp rock. I was disrupted by the sound of a car door slamming across the street. I stepped behind the tree and watched as a couple were getting out of their car and sat on a porch swing near their front door and started talking. I decided that I wanted to listen to their conversation just for the hell of it and snuck to a tree near their location. I quickly got bored with the conversation and got more interested in finding out how close to them I could actually get without them figuring it out. So I doubled back to the first tree I was throwing rocks at and made my way into the woods, then turned back in their direction. 
Getting back to the road, I could see them off in the distance, being out of their view, back in the dark. I ran across the street and made it to their backyard. Sneaking around to the back door, I jiggled the doorknob just out of curiosity and actually found it unlocked. But I left it alone since I don't break into houses. Well, ones that aren't connected to Butcher Face anyway. So I continued around. So I continued around the opposite side of the house and got to the porch right next to the couple. They still didn't know that I was right next to them. It was at this point that I realized that I still had that sharp rock that I was using to hack into the tree in my hand. I quietly dropped it into the grass and I was relieved that they didn't hear it hit, but I was interrupted by clattering behind me with loud barking. I spun around and found a big dog barking at me from a window that was right next to me. It scared the crap out of me and I just booked it into the woods and ran all the way home. I didn't make it home that night until about 4.30 in the morning. I didn't get up until around noon. I was extremely late for work and tried to get there as soon as possible. I stupidly tried to sneak in, but my boss found me almost immediately, said that I had been coming into work far too late, far too much, and that I should just go home. Anger welled up in me. I now realized that that anger was already there and had just gotten stronger at that moment. I was angry almost all the time at this point, but I held it in and just walked out. Although I did flip off the security camera at the door on my way out. I spent the rest of the day watching TV until Chris got home and I informed him that I'd been fired. He wasn't too happy about me losing my job, saying that I wouldn't be able to pay the rent. We had a fight and he stormed out saying that he needed to cool down. This was pretty normal around this time. He barely spent any time at the house, though I still didn't know where he was going, which piqued my curiosity. And a couple of days later, I followed him and found out that he was going to his ex's house. I got the distinct feeling that she wasn't exactly his ex anymore, although I wasn't happy that he had to hide that from me. A few days after this, after getting home from looking for a new job and getting the mail, I found out that one of the letters had writing smeared across it in what appeared to be either red paint or nail polish. All it said was, the line was crossed at nine. It was another random message that seemed out of character from Butcherface, but it was even more random for him. Feeling alone and still strongly interested in the butcher face case, I stopped looking for a new job and essentially became a recluse. I hadn't left the house for a week and a half, hadn't seen Chris for even longer than that, and I hadn't seen Emma for almost two weeks. That's when I decided to go back to the house that we'd found in the previous chapter, the one we started calling the House of Butcher Face. I wanted to know what was in the box that we'd found in the barn. I left just as the sun was setting. Once getting there, I glanced through one of the windows of the house. It was dark and it appeared mostly the same, except for what looked like hundreds of two-foot strands of yarn of multiple colors hanging from the ceiling. I had no interest in entering and exploring the house further. I just walked around the back of the house and headed straight for the barn. Opening the door, it also appeared to be mostly the same. The brick tree was still there, except there was more art on the walls, uh, the bright lights were no longer on, and the glass sculpture that resembled fire was also missing. But the box I was looking for was still there. It was in another position, as if it had been moved, though. I walked right up to it and reached for it, but froze. My hand was inches from it, but I started thinking about why I was doing this. I realized that I had fallen into his trap. This is what he wanted me to do. I was acting just like Chris when he'd been obsessed, maybe even worse. I left the barn and walked into the field that sits behind it. It was dark now and the field was full of fireflies. I started pacing around much like I'd been doing the previous nights, but this time it was because I was deep in thought. I realized that my interest in Butcherface had been displaced. 
I'd been doing exactly what we said Butcherface wanted us to do, to become obsessed with what his message was and to follow him in an attempt to find out what that answer was. I still had questions though, the obvious one being what that message was. It was at that point that I realized I wasn't really sure I wanted to know. I then thought of another question. We had gone to multiple places that we suspected Butcherface was living in, or had been living in, but we never caught him by surprise. We had never walked into a dilapidated house and found him snoring away on a pile of trash. It's as if he always knew we were going to be at one of his hideouts. I then remembered the hidden cameras we'd found around our house a while back. Was he still watching us? Then I got a chill down to my spine when I realized he could be watching me right at that moment. I suddenly felt extremely exposed. I looked into the dark woods that surrounded the field and got the overwhelming feeling that I was being watched. That's when I decided I didn't want to do this anymore. Butcherface hadn't helped any of us. I was done with him. A couple of days later, I had just gotten home from looking for another job and found Chris's girlfriend's car in our driveway. I pulled up just as she was stepping out of it. it. Turned out she was meeting Chris after work. We walked into the house, and I told her about what had happened back at the house of Butcherface, but admitted that trying to get away from the obsession wasn't easy. I was still finding myself thinking about it a lot. Uh, having ADD, I'm used to having my attention wander, but it was happening more than usual, and it was automatically focusing on trying to decipher the butcher face media. It, she said it might be time to admit that I needed help. I instinctively started to get mad, but then realized she was right. I apprehensively agreed, but admitted that I had no idea where to start. She then told me that she had had a psychiatrist while in high school. I asked if it worked, and she said that, yeah, it really did. And she didn't even have to see the doctor anymore after a while, and agreed to give me the doctor's number. Chris came home soon after, and they left without saying a word. She gave me the number the next day, and I set up an appointment. A week later, I was sitting in the doctor's office. Let's call him Dr. Fidim. It started very, very awkwardly, with him asking a bunch of probing questions. I told him everything, finding the butcher face media, the stalking, the break-ins, Chris's obsession, Jesse's falling toward obsession, the house of butcher face, my growing compulsions, and the other problems. He would just nod and jot things down on a pad of paper. We then had a good, long talk. I'm not sure if he really believed any of what I was saying, but he prescribed me Zoloft, and we set up monthly sessions. As I was leaving, he asked me if I could produce any proof of Butcherface. I said I didn't think that was a good idea, but he said that he just wanted something to corroborate the story. I set off for home, feeling good. I felt like I was taking a step closer to being free from all of this for good. My life was getting too dark. I was looking forward to hanging out with my friends and my girlfriend again instead of falling into dark analysis of some psycho's art. Then I pulled into my driveway and found my door wide open. I cautiously got out of the car and walked to the open door and saw wide streaks of some dark red liquid leading out from the door through the living room and down the hallway toward my room. I slowly followed it through the house and found that it led to the room next to my bedroom where I keep my collections, movie memorabilia and the sword collection I'd mentioned, with the door slightly ajar. I kicked the door open not wanting to be jumped by someone on the other side and found the room empty. The red streaks led obviously into the room and then took a right turn and stopped close to the wall, ending in a smeared circle on the carpet. Sitting in the center of the circle was the box that was in the barn at the house of Butcher Face. Crudely written in red on the wall above it was count to eight at the last gate. An empty can of paint sat tipped over in the corner in a pool of dark red 
my collection of swords had been stabbed into the wall as well, with the blades jutting out on the other side of the wall in my room where my head would be on my bed. I picked up the box and brought it into the living room, putting it on the coffee table. I sat on the couch and just stared at it, fighting every urge to open it. One side of my brain kept saying, just a peek, it won't hurt anything. The other half kept bringing up the fact that I just came back from a therapist session in an attempt to stop this very obsession. I really didn't know how long I sat there staring. It literally could have been hours, but I ultimately decided to put it on the floor and slide it under the coffee table, deciding to figure out what to do with it later. Although while I was sliding the box under the table, I noticed some writing on its back. I turned it around and found Fratris Rutilis Phasma carved into the wood. The Zoloft that Dr. Fidim gave me was not fun. I was pretty much stoned off my ass because of the serotonin flood, which was a feeling that I wasn't a fan of. I just kept getting feelings that Butcherface was watching me, you know, the paranoia. In fact, the first time I took it, I was sitting on the couch in the living room and seemed to remember seeing the front door open slowly. And that's it. The memory fades out after that, although I slowly got used to it. After a while, when I decided it was working for me, I made plans to go to dinner with Emma at an expensive restaurant in the city. I hadn't seen her for a while, and we wanted to sort of celebrate my transition away from Butcher Face. Just as I was walking out the door, I got a call from Jesse, who I hadn't seen since we found the butcher face mask in his desk. He wanted to meet up for dinner as well. I told him my plans with Emma, and he said that we should meet him at his loft, which was in the same city, and added that he had a much more interesting activity planned. I was apprehensive, but I agreed to it. After picking up Emma and arriving at Jesse's loft, he jumped into the driver's seat and told us our destination was a surprise. We were nervous, but we agreed to go. As a side note, this was actually the first time that Emma and Jesse had met. During the drive, he talked the whole trip, uh, just about random topics, art projects, new tattoos, people we didn't know, altering his Bane mask to make it his own, and something about an underground art exhibit. Now, after a while, he said, we're here, and turned around a corner into the parking lot of a zoo. It was about 10 o'clock at night. What were we gonna do at a zoo this late? He got us out of the car, and as we walked to the gate, he called someone on his phone and said, hey, we're here, and hung up. After waiting at the gate for a moment, we were met by a man neither Emma nor I knew, but who was friends with Jesse. He opened the gate and escorted us through the zoo to another gate sitting in the back, letting us into an area intended for employees only. It was at this point that I started to get really nervous. I could tell Emma was as well. This was beginning to feel like a bad idea. We were then ushered into a large, gray, cube-like building full of people. A balcony above our heads was also full of people. There were large doors on the opposite wall, and I believe this was where they usually kept the elephants, but instead, the large cement floor was made into a makeshift racetrack. Animal noises could be heard in a room nearby. Jesse had been chatting with his friends the whole time, and we were still confused as to what the hell was going on. We had apparently gotten there just in time because the door to the room making the animal noises soon opened up and a number of people walked out with small monkeys on their shoulders and directing a group of small pigs toward the racetrack. The entire building burst into applause. I grabbed Jesse by the shoulder and spun him toward us and asked what the hell was going on. He informed us that most of the people here worked at the zoo and they had trained the monkeys to ride the pigs like little horses. It was very random, the what the hell kind of moment, but I must admit that I kind of wanted to see it. The riders were placed on their steeds in the racetrack and money began quickly changing hands. 
everyone began chanting, counting down, three, two, one, go! And the whole building burst into more applause as the race began. After making three laps around the track, the race finished and the animals were given treats, picked up and brought back into their room, only to be replaced by a new group of pigs and monkeys. This continued for about two hours. One of the winning monkeys even raised his fist in triumph as if he knew that he'd won, and everybody cheered. We lost Jesse in the commotion after a while, but we continued to watch the games. Shortly after I realized Jesse's absence, his friend who greeted us at the gate tapped me on the shoulder and said, Your friend asked me to give you this, while handing me a folded piece of ripped paper. Expecting it to be from Jesse, I unfolded it and found seven gateways have already been opened, and not to heaven, written on it at a steep angle. I quickly asked him who gave him the note. He pointed over some heads and into the crowd, saying, he did, and after a pause added, oh, I'm sorry, he's gone. Looking around, I said, I'll see if I can find him, and left. I grabbed Emma by the hand and led her through the crowd to the wall near the door that we had come in so that we could have something against our back and called Jesse. He picked up and the first thing I asked him was if he'd asked his friend to give me the note. It was hard to hear him through all of the commotion in the room, but I'm certain that he said no. I then told him that we were leaving. He asked for us to stay, but I refused, and since we were his ride, he agreed to leave too. Emma and I then went ahead with our original plans to have dinner at a nice restaurant. The problem was that after all this time, most of them were closed, and it was close to midnight. We ended up at a McDonald's, where the mood soon lightened. We were laughing and telling stories. Emma lightened up to Jesse, too, and they started to get along. The night ended on a better note than it had started on, and we all agreed to hang out again. About a week later, I was back in Dr. Fidham's office. He said that he really wanted to find the source of my obsession. Finding the source could help in aiding my recovery. He went on to say that any obsession, or fixation as he called it, can often have a sexual connotation, which made me thoroughly uncomfortable. He most likely noticed this and went on to mention that the images in Butcher Faces media were violent. Violence has deep sexual connections, such as sadomasochism, which is getting sexually gratified by causing pain to yourself or others, as well as rape, which is actually more a form of control than a form of sexual release. After a while, my gaze made its way to looking at the floor. It was getting close to the end of the session and the conversation had gotten really deep. I heard him open and close a drawer from his desk and I glanced up at him to see a burlap mask looking back at me. I gave out a yell and instinctively began climbing up the back of the couch trying to get away. He quickly took the mask off and tried to calm me down, explaining that he had made the mask out of the description that I had given of it during our first session and he was attempting to use it as part of the therapy. Sort of a curing arachnophobia with spiders kind of thing. He ended the session by asking if I had any evidence of butcher face like he had asked during our first session. I showed him the envelope and the ripped paper that I had gotten over the past few weeks as well as pictures of the writing on my car and the wall at the house and left. Later that day, Chris's brother Evan stopped by looking for Chris, obviously who was still spending most of his time away from the house. I told him that he'd most likely be around soon and said that he should sit down and wait for him. We sat in the living room and I told him about my therapist sessions and Emma, who he still hadn't met. It turned out that he was finally moving out of his parents' house. He still wasn't sure where yet and I asked if he wanted a drink and went into the kitchen. I was filling up a glass of soda when he asked, Hey, what's in here? I asked what he was talking about and he answered the box under the coffee table. I realized that he was talking about Butcherface's box. I'd slid it under the coffee table a while back and completely forgotten about it. 
I dropped the glass that I was filling with soda, causing it to shatter on the floor, and ran back to the living room to find Evan looking into the open box. From the angle I was at, I couldn't see into it. He looked at me and then asked, What the hell is this? I tried to stammer an answer, but I didn't have one. Then he added, This is that box Chris told me about, isn't it? The one you guys found at the house. I tried telling him that I found it and I hadn't looked in it. He slammed the box shut, got a disgusted look on his face, stood up and headed for the door. I tried to explain, but he was already out the door getting into his car. Finally, out of anything else to say, I asked what was in the box, but he slammed the car door and drove away. I turned around and slowly walked back to the box. Something in it had made Evan leave. I reached out and grabbed the latch that had been closed when Evan slammed the box shut and froze. I stood there just for a second and then said no, picked up the box and threw it in the trash. A couple days later, I was out, still looking for a job. I got a call from Dr. Fidham asking if I had come across any more butcher face media. I awkwardly said no, and he said, okay, and hung up. Pulling into my driveway, I found my trash canister tipped over onto the street with the trash bags ripped open and garbage strewn all over. I poked through the trash and I noticed that the box was now missing. I spent the next 15 minutes ignoring the glares of the people driving by and removing the trash from the street. I finally got into the house, made myself lunch, mindlessly took my meds. I tried not thinking about the missing box or what was in it. It was just another attempt at a push by Butcherface to follow him. The good thing about it was that this showed me that he knew he was losing. Soon, I began to feel lightheaded. It kept getting worse, and I couldn't keep my balance anymore. My head felt too heavy to hold up and my fingers got numb. Thankfully, I was sitting on my couch and I fell sideways lying flat out on the couch. I had just enough coherence to glance at the coffee table and notice my medication and realize that someone had switched it with some sort of sedative. Then everything faded to black. I don't know how long I was out, but I did momentarily gain consciousness and found myself lying on a dirt floor in a dark room. I could hear some people screaming off in the distance as if fighting. Uh, I opened my eyes to find the girl we saw on Chris's ex's camera, the, the, the one we named False Face, about ten feet away from me. Her hair was now short and red, and she was wearing a paper mache mask that resembled Heath Ledger's Joker makeup in The Dark Knight, with black circles around the eyes and a big, wide, red, messy grin. A glint of metal caught my eye, and I looked to her hands and saw that they were covered in strange assortments of small metal bars that came together to form metallic gloves with four or five inch metal claws extending from the fingers. She was dressed in a pink tutu, which was oddly fitting because she slowly ballet danced as if the screaming was music to dance to. Needless to say, she was too busy to notice that I was awake, but it didn't matter because I lost consciousness again. I seem to remember muffled talking, uh, an animalistic screeching sound being moved again and the sound of a door slamming. I gained consciousness again and found myself in an even darker room. A faint glow dimly lit the room around me, and it looked familiar. I tried to sit up and found something heavy on my face. I reached up and felt something metal was over my head. There were eye holes in various shapes protruding from it, and I realized that it was a mask. I sat up slipped the heavy mask off and found myself back in Butcher Face's barn. I was on a thick wooden table sitting up against the brick tree that's in the middle of the room. I looked in front of me and saw the faint glow was coming from the laptop on the tall crate that we originally found the mysterious box on. I looked at the shape of a pig's head 
with sharp spear-like points for ears and a bent metal cylinder for the nose. Throwing the mask onto the floor, I set my hands on the table, ready to heave myself off of it, and felt something under my hand. I picked it up and noticed that it was Chris's girlfriend's camera. I put the camera in my pocket and slid off the table, made my way to the laptop. It was open to the Butcherface website that Chris, myself, and his ex saw at the previous chapter. It was on a page that had pictures of people wearing masks of different designs. I began scrolling down the page and it just kept going. Picture after picture rolled by, but I stopped at one. It resembled a Bane mask, but different enough that most people wouldn't even have recognized it as one. The only reason why I knew it was was because of Jesse's Bane mask. I pushed the laptop off the crate, causing it to fall on the floor, the screen going black. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Still feeling lightheaded, I stumbled across the barn to the doors and attempted to push them open, but they were locked. I stood there trying to think of a way to get the doors open, maybe a tool or a cu I could try kicking it. Then I remembered the hatch in the floor that I had noticed in the previous chapter. I found it in the darkness and pulled it open, climbing down the ladder. It was pitch black in that basement. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I took a step forward and bumped into something wooden. I wasn't going to get out of here without some light. I then remembered the camera in my pocket and turned it on. Remembering what had happened previously with this camera, I checked to see if any pictures had been left on it. The first one was a hand holding a piece of paper in the shot. On the paper were taped crude words cut from a uh, magazine or magazines. All it said was, the six will fix. I deleted it and saw the rest of the pictures were just normal pictures of Chris's girlfriend. I then used the flash of it to light my way through the basement, which appeared arranged into a maze. Crates and trash were stacked up, creating makeshift walls that twisted and turned, never going in one direction for very long. Trash and other objects littered the floor, like mannequins, old clothing, furniture, objects also hung from the ceiling by strings. Logs with the bark still on them were used as pillars to prop up the barn above it. The basement seemed to have been dug out, widening into what was essentially a cave now. I don't really know how big it actually was since I could only get what I saw through the split-second flashes of the camera. With all the corners and stuff leaning against the crude walls, it was also very confusing. I came to dead ends many times and had to go back the way I'd come. These things also created shadows in the flashes of light as if I'd caught something moving. I had the feeling of being watched even more now. It's like that feeling you get when you have to keep your eyes closed while washing your hair in the shower. That feeling that there's something standing right behind you. I was getting nervous, uh, making myself more lost. I tried to push a wall of crates over, but they were surprisingly sturdy. I remember turning around a corner and finding an ornately carved bookcase blocking my path. There was only one book on the shelf. It looked extremely old and seemed to be falling apart. I picked it up and looked at the worn cover. The title was Advertere Rutilus Phasma. I put the book back on the shelf and went back the way I'd come. I found a straight pathway along the dirt wall that led through the doorway dug in the dirt that descended deeper into the ground and around a corner to somewhere larger and darker. I backtracked and followed the dirt wall until I was cut off by another wall of crates. Then I followed that. Getting to its end, I turned that corner and finally saw a beam of moonlight shining out from another corner. I ran around it and found the door. Then I climbed a small flight of stairs and threw the door open, finding myself finally outside in the woods near the barn. Now that I was finally free of whatever labyrinth that I had just emerged from, I avoided the House of Butcherface, which appeared to have some sort of faint firelight coming out of the windows, and ran to the road and started walking in the direction of home. 
that walk would have taken days without a car, so I called up the only person who was currently talking to me, and was actually close enough to pick me up. That would be Chris's girlfriend. I continued walking along the road until she pulled up and picked me up. On the drive home, I told her what had happened and how I had ended up back at the House of Butcherface, admitting that it did seem suspicious, but that I was truly trying to stay away from him. He just wasn't making it easy. I don't think that Butcherface was trying to kidnap me. He knew exactly what I would do and what I would find. It was obvious that he wasn't done with me, either. She asked how it was going with Dr. Fittum, and I brought up the strange call that I'd gotten from him the day before. Then I noticed a nervous look on her face. I gave back her camera, which she hadn't even known was missing, and thanked her for picking me up. She smiled again, said it was no problem, and added that she wanted to get Chris and I talking again. The next day, she successfully got the two of us in a room together where I told him everything that had happened and tried to show him that I was truly trying to fight it. I also told him about his brother's visit, and he said that he'd check in on him. At one point, I noticed that Chris's girlfriend was acting distant again, and when she left to go to the bathroom, I asked him what her problem was since we'd gotten along so well the night before. He told me that after she dropped me off at home and drove herself home, she got curious and looked at the pictures that I'd taken while using the camera's flash to find my way out of the barn's basement, and found something in them that she thought was disturbing. I asked what it was, and he told me he didn't know. I didn't believe him. I told him to tell me what she'd found. He said he was telling the truth. He really didn't know. When she came back, I asked her what she found in those pictures. She looked at Chris a little disappointedly and said that it wasn't important. I stood up and demanded that she show me the pictures. She told me I was getting obsessed again and it would help if I stopped trying to see them. She added that she uh, deleted them anyway. I knew she was right. I calmed myself down. Chris and I began talking about Butcherface again not as obsessed possible disciples, but as two people who had gotten a deep understanding about how strange and interesting it can be the deeper you go. We still wondered how he draws people in, deciding that the better we understand this obsession, the better we can fight it. Our original assumption was that his media and his attacks were a sort of brainwashing, but brainwashing requires constant sleep deprivation, partial sensory deprivation, psychological harassment, and group social pressure. Butcherface's actions had admittedly all of this, but it could be spread out over weeks, even months. For brainwashing to work, these actions would have to be done constantly, almost non-stop, and behind closed doors. His media seemed to be more of a subtle encouragement or persuasion to change his potential disciples' psychology and some pushes by Butcherface and his friends. He wants everyone to want to wonder what his message is, and his media is the way to do that. He liked to repetitively use the CV symbol to drill something familiar into our minds, like some sort of brand symbol or logo. That's when I realized it. Butcherface isn't using his media to brainwash people. He's advertising. But what's he promoting? Personally, I don't want to know. So, this bastard's a marketer. Oh, that just makes things worse. It does explain a lot, though. Oh, hey, did you know that most modern ad techniques are actually derived from wartime propaganda? Turns out, the more you know, the worse the world looks to you. Ah, cynicism. Stay scary, wildlings. Keep a flashlight on your keychain. And make the most of your nights.